Hey guys, hope you've been taking it easy. As always, me and Matt just want to let you know how much we appreciate your guys' support. It's honestly insane considering how new we are to this, and I can't believe that we're almost at 600 subs. Just seeing you guys in the comments, it's what keeps me going with this and always making sure that I'm producing the best content possible for you guys. And always just got to take a quick sec before every episode just to let you know how much it means to me. But with all that out of the way, let's get right into this episode of GTA Stories. The story we're going to cover today is an important part of Toronto's history because it would lead to various effects on how the media portrays street gangs as complex criminal networks committing homicides throughout the city to further their illegal enterprises. When in reality are usually tight-knit crews of teenagers involved in revenge killings. This case would also further the ideology of young men inheriting a cycle of violence as the world around them failed to understand their plight of growing up in such hostile environments. The police had evolved their tactics from this point on how to build cases around young men involved with street gangs. Because today we're taking a look at the personal account of Jason Wisdom who faced an onslaught of charges with the courts hell-bent on proving him guilty of committing a homicide during a turf war. Jason Wisdom, otherwise known as CD, grew up in the Galloway neighborhood within Scarborough and would be influenced by this area from a very young age. He was born in 1985 in Scarborough and would come from a middle-class family and he noted from the time he could remember was exposed to seeing young men in his neighborhood being involved with various criminal activities. I also covered how turbulent the late 80s and early 90s were for Toronto in a previous episode, but the short version is a recession would hit and it pushed upper middle class families towards the surrounding suburbs of Toronto leaving many families to struggle in the inner city and expose many residents to a massive crime wave. This fact is important because Jason would note growing up, nobody in his neighborhood had nice possessions and all seemed to struggle financially. Except for the drug dealers and pimps decked out in gold chains, brand name clothing, and always had a new pair of shoes to boot. And he envied them for this reason. Being physically gifted, Jason had a dream of becoming a professional athlete. But as a black Canadian during the early 90s, he knew that he would get little to no exposure to make it in the world of sports. He also struggled to afford equipment so he could participate. With that one point in his childhood, recalling only having a pair of cleats to wear, because they were the only shoes they could afford and he loved to play baseball. Galloway, the area that Jason grew up in, would have multiple tight-knit crews made up of predominantly young Jamaican immigrants that had a significant amount of influence in Jason's neighborhood. Galloway would intersect with Kingston Road, which brought a steady stream of clientele from Scarborough's downtown section. Along Kingston Road were motels used by these influential crews, rampant with prostitution and drugs. During the mid-90s, it became a hotspot for truckers to pass through, with the pimps and pushers making a killing. Jason describes Scarborough to be a much safer place in terms of gun violence than it is today. They all had their own stream of revenue, and back in this time, there were no divider lines within the city being able to move freely. In Jason's words, he said there was no op block like there is today, probably referring to the surrounding hoods like Orton Park and Malvern. In 1997, Jason would get involved in the street life himself. Being only 12 years old, he said that he'd seen nothing wrong with it, considering it a business opportunity and with no other tangible prospects in life, he viewed it as a way to better his situation. His friends would be a couple years older, with Jason being the youngest of the group. He always was big for his age, so he never seemed out of place, and by 1999, at 14, he started selling drugs with his friends. 
Jason was physically intimidating even to the buyers, which usually were double his age. Through the years, the police cracked down on crews contributing to Kingston Road's underworld, with many young men that Jason looked up to either going to prison or being deported. The younger generation would fill the void in the streets, but with the police ramping up patrols along with numerous other raids, the streets became too heat for dealers, and this would create competition between the pushers throughout Scarborough as they spread out their operations. Jason continued his education and kept playing baseball. He also loved hip hop and would be nicknamed CD by his peers. He would use this nickname as an alias while hustling in the streets and this added to his street persona. I also made a video detailing how dangerous Galloway was in the 2000s when tensions began to brew with a neighborhood to the north of them known as Malvern. The police struggled to string together majority of the shootings suspected to be involved in the turf war but were able to prove rising tensions in the area with there being an increase in homicides. Between 2000 and 2002, the police had labeled many homicides that occurred in the Galloway area as victims of a drug war. And to this day, majority of the homicides remain cold cases. The police were unable to prove who killed these men, but still considered them to be casualties of street gangs. Law enforcement also created the name of Galloway Boys in the late 90s, reporting it to media outlets when crimes were covered from the area. There supposedly was a crew that went by the name of the Galloway Posse to pay homage to the Jamaican immigrants that used to run the area, with these immigrants also calling their crews posses, but it wasn't as complex as the police made it out to seem. And it's assumed the Galloway Posse would adopt the name given to them by the media and shorten it to G-Way to avoid detection. As criminals like Jason adapted to their increasingly hostile environment, it would lead to them committing robberies as it became more lucrative than selling drugs. And shootouts would become more commonplace throughout Galloway and Malvern. Jason detailed that most days would consist of him smoking weed and slinging drugs while hanging out with his friends, but did see how dangerous the streets were becoming and as things escalated, Jason would be caught in the middle. On October 10th, 2002, a known drug dealer to police would be murdered, which was Norris Allen, age 21, who was a resident of Galloway, would be sitting in his car listening to music when around 1.40pm his vehicle was shot several times, leaving Norris Allen dead. This homicide is suspected to lead to another daylight shooting at an intersection between Finch Avenue and Nielsen Road which occurred on March 3rd, 2004. Brenton Carlton, age 34, and Leonard Bell, age 43, were stopped at a red light when they were approached by another vehicle that unleashed a hail of bullets at them. Leonard Bell would be severely injured, with Brenton Carlton being killed during the shooting. Both men would be returning from work and had no involvement with any street gangs. The police believed after Norris Allen was killed, who they suspected of being a high-ranking member of G-Way, that the murder led to a subset known as the Throwbacks to be formed by Tashawn Riley. They assumed the Throwbacks sought revenge against members of the Melvern crew, another gang that formed in a very similar fashion with having a similar system of loose-knit crews banded together under one neighborhood. The Throwbacks was the crew that Jason was a part of, and the police would use emergency wiretaps on the gang that were approved by the courts due to how many innocent people had been killed along with the recent shooting of Brenton Carlton. Emergency wiretaps are usually used to prevent further danger, but the police would use them to investigate the Galloway boys, and would use the same tactics as they did in the past with using citizens of the city to be the next victim so they could gather evidence against both gangs. Two innocent teenagers would be shot while the police were extensively investigating the Galloway boys. 
with over 13,000 lines of dialogue being recorded through multiple wiretaps that were placed throughout trap houses, cars, and other key locations that could have been used to prevent the shooting of the two teens. Jason, unfortunately, ended up on a lot of these recordings, and he was also involved in a robbery gone wrong in June. While under investigation, Jason was recorded for two weeks detailing an inside job that would occur at a money mart in Pickering. With all of this happening more than three months after the murder of Brenton Carlton, Jason would arrive with his friends at the Money Mart and as they began to hype each other up while casing the building from the outside, they leaned up against a black Dodge Durango. Gauging the Money Mart from this position, all they had to do was enter the back door which was left unlocked for them and would be in and out without a hassle. They began to cross the street towards the Money Mart when the black truck they leaned up against flashed its lights. Dozens of sirens, choppers, and numerous police cruisers would close in on them. Jason was arrested but was released shortly after and was given a court date. Another four months would pass with law enforcement gathering a mountain of evidence raiding both Malvern and Galloway on October 1st, 2004. Jason recalled that it felt like any other day was riding his bike to a McDonald's nearby when he then decided to go to a friend that was living on Danzig Street. Jason got to his friend's house, but it had been raided and trashed by the police. They laughed together and Jason would joke around about the situation and hang around for a little while longer, but then would get back on his bike to go see two other friends known as Smokey and Sledge. When he arrived, they informed him that the police had been carrying out raids all over Scarborough within Malvern and Galloway. Jason began to feel nervous now. They turned on CP24 and Jason's face was all over the screen. It read, wanted for connection to a homicide to benefit a criminal organization. They would watch the TV in shock as Jason's face appeared on every news channel. Another would read wanted for participation in a legal organization, which is basically the Canadian version of a RICO case. Jason couldn't believe it. His family were ringing his phone down. Completely panicked, he decided to go home and gather his thoughts. He would call a cab, but it turned out that the cab was working with law enforcement. Jason would be taken down the street when he was arrested by a swarm of police at a designated takedown point. Jason would be grouped in with the Galloway boys and charged for multiple crimes. His friend Sledge flipped while giving a statement, and the police would use this to lay charges against Jason, Deshaun Riley, and another man named Philip Atkins, believing all three men to be responsible for the shooting that killed Brenton Carlton and wounded Leonard Bell. They delayed Jason and the two other men's statements until the first hearing. This would be a high profile case with massive media coverage. Jason's face was in every newspaper around the country, which also affected his chances during the hearings. And this method of grouping members together to be charged as an organization was the first of its kind to ever be used in Canada. Jason was also charged for the shooting of Brenton Carlton and Leonard Bell. The Crown charged all three men with the murder to benefit a criminal organization. This would be an extremely complex case. Jason would serve five years in Don Jail while being aggressively questioned through every court session. He stood trial and fought for his life, but the police had a ridiculous number of resources to take him down. With the government sanctioning 43 new divisions throughout law enforcement, which meant forming new gang drug task forces, passing laws, and built courthouses in numerous jurisdictions. Millions of dollars were spent to create an infrastructure that would take down the Galloway boys and any gang similar to them. This impacted the city in various ways with many raids following the same formula and has proven to be an effective tactic. 
The 13,000 lines of dialogue recorded through emergency wiretaps would be twisted against Jason, being questioned about every last word said on the wire. He detailed these five years as extremely stressful and was always panicked on what he'd be grilled on next. Sledge's testimony was also played in court, which was unreliable but painted the exact image the police needed. Allegedly, the tape would play throughout the entire courtroom, documenting Kashawn and Philip being seen driving together. The tape then suddenly cuts out, then cuts back in, with Sledge retracting this statement, and says that he also seen Jason being dropped off at the trap house as well. Where he then said that Jason detailed following a Ross, a Rastafarian looking man, who are usually known for sporting long dreads, Jason supposedly proceeded to tell Sledge that he followed this Rastafarian looking man to a red light and carried out the murder. But both Brenton Carlton and Leonard Bell were clean cut with short hair, and Sledge implied that Jason seemed to carry out this hit alone, but then manages to slip something in referring to his last statement where he did see Tashawn and Philip dropping Jason off to meet their mutual friend, Smokey. Sledge's statement would flip back and forth, with the judge asking the jury to disregard how Sledge's statement was laid out, but urged that it still had merit in concluding that the three carried out the shooting with the last statement that was given. Tashawn Riley had also known Sledge since they were kids, they would sell crack together when they were 14 years old, using Sledge's mom's house as a drug den. When she found out what they were doing, she kicked Sledge out, and Deshaun claims that he harbored a vendetta for this, implying this to be the reason why Sledge turned on the gang. He would not only lie to save himself, but he would settle an old score he had with Deshaun. Everything I said isn't proven as fact, but come from personal accounts, but think anyone who was involved in these charges was done a disservice and not treated fairly when it went to trial. Jason was demonized in the media as a 19 year old kingpin and shooter. Being 6 foot 5 and having an aura in the streets wouldn't help his case. They said Jason had committed robberies and it was clear how the gang would plan and organize themselves before carrying out crimes. Jason would argue that the Money Mart robbery was irrelevant because the robbery occurred three months after the murder and said he could have learned how to set this robbery up through other sources and that the robbery was actually planned differently. With them not using any guns and on tape were recorded multiple times saying no sticks which alluded to the fact. This was still used to charge Jason and all three men had separate pieces of evidence that the court believed when put together it proved these men to be connected to the murder and all three of them were charged for the homicide. The way the case was laid out meant that they were charged with participation in an organization, murder, and attempt of murder, with Jason also being charged with another two counts of attempted murder. Basically, the sentence was 18 years, but to be served consecutively with another life sentence. In all, Jason would be sentenced to 45 years, to Sean Riley would be charged for the shooting of the two teens while under investigation and was sentenced to three life sentences to be served consecutively, adding up to 65 years. Jason was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 at the age of 24 years old. He'd be transferred to multiple maximum security prisons while serving time. Jason and his family were crushed. His time in prison was extremely traumatic. He had become extremely desperate to survive, crossed between how far he should go to live and without losing hope on ever proving his innocence. After he was there for so many years, his family and friends stopped coming to see him. He didn't feel any animosity, just as if he had already died and the world was simply moving on without him. On separate occasions, he witnessed multiple stabbings. Inmates would threaten guards during small-scale riots with them being shot in return, and Jason feared how he would die in prison. 
He had been tear gassed multiple times during these riots, with also seeing seven inmates in total being shot. With one occurrence, an inmate was struck in the head with a bullet, killing him instantly. Every year that passed, Jason would change, but he also educated himself on the law, never losing hope, and was focused on proving that he wasn't given a fair trial. He appealed that the proof given to find him guilty was insufficient, and with the courts including the separate robbery, had demonized him, making a case that it added to his persona as a gangster and felt that it stood on grounds for a mistrial. All evidence used to charge the three men came from personal testimonies. Leonard Bell, unfortunately being the most important of them all, said he didn't remember who shot him and his friend but stated that he was satisfied on how the case was concluded, saying the streets felt safer with all three of them behind bars. Jason's appeal would be delayed for two years, but in 2017, he was given a retrial and was found innocent. Leonard Bell was supportive of the court's decisions and thought if Jason truly was an innocent man that he deserved to be free. Jason is a completely changed man, but did say his past is a part of his life and has made him the man who he is today, and doesn't know how his life would have turned out if not for going through this experience. Like I said before, this case changed the way that law enforcement forms cases to take down gangs throughout Canada and Toronto. Jason Wisdom wasn't a perfect guy, but I hope with telling his story, it adds another perspective on how people get involved with living a life of crime, and majority of the time are normal people who get caught in horrible situations. Jason's case is a lucky one, with others, some are exposed to a cycle of violence completely desensitizing them, with them feeding into the cycle committing horrible crimes that have great consequences. Jason was able to become a more positive person and never truly lost who he was. Today, he is still a huge fan of hip-hop and he wants to see Toronto grow to have the biggest rap scene in the world. And he believes in his city. He works as an A&R today, which is responsible for representing artists, particularly in his case, from Toronto. And they help them make connections throughout the entertainment industry, providing the younger generation with opportunities. And his end goal is to get them signed to a rap label, creating a more positive image to the people that might look up to him today. I'm really interested on what you guys have to say about this episode. And like I said before, I think it adds a unique perspective on things and believe history is best recorded through personal accounts. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe because it lets me and Matt know what you guys are into. With all that out of the way, I hope you guys have a good one and I'll catch you guys in the comments. From since I was young, I knew that I had to sell drugs to fucking get by. I knew that I had to rob people to get by. I knew that you live by the gun, you die by a gun. But the main thing is you still need to have your gun because people might blow your fucking face out of the frame.